Are you struggling to keep up with the demands of managing and securing identity in your distributed enterprise IT environment? You're not alone, but don't let it hold you back. With Strata's identity orchestration platform, you can secure all your apps on any cloud with any IDP, so your IT teams will never have to refactor for identity again. Imagine modernizing app identity in minutes instead of months, deploying passwordless on any trick old app, and achieving business resilience with always-on identity, all from one lightweight and flexible platform. Want to see it in action? Share your identity challenge with us on a discovery call and we'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cloudcast. That's strata.io slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hope everybody is doing well. We are getting towards the towards the end of January 2023 and another Sunday Perspective show. As I mentioned before, for those of you new to the Sunday Perspective show, kind of the way that we, we put these things together oftentimes is, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be reading through some things. We'll find, uh, you know, one or two sort of interesting data points, and we try and connect the dots between those. And what I found is interesting so far this year, uh, this is the third Sunday Perspective Sunday of 2023, is, you know, I, I originally started off doing a show about uh, kind of some perspective on how uh, Microsoft had evolved. Um, and in doing that, it got me thinking about, you know, some other companies that we talked a little bit about VMware last week. Um, but I came back to, you know, one of the things that I read in researching some of the Microsoft stuff from uh, Stephen O'Grady over at Red Monk, who, again, we are uh, huge fans of Red Monk, huge fans of Stephen, uh, the work that they do, their perspective uh, on on the software industry and developers and so forth. But, you know, what struck uh, what stuck out at me, and there's a, a link in the show notes to an article that he wrote, uh, really talking about kind of, you know, how oftentimes organizations are building things, uh, you know, building technology, whether it's uh, for internal use or whether it's, uh, you know, for a, for a product or a technology that is shipping out into the world. And how oftentimes uh, the ones that struggle uh, will what they call ship their organization, meaning um, some of the things that internally they do with the, within the company, the way the company's organized, the way the company um, you know, measures things, the way they reward people and so forth um, is kind of based on their own internal organization. It's based on uh, you know, what they do well, what they're trying to achieve, and oftentimes this can be problematic because it is oftentimes in stark contrast or in partial contrast to what's really needed by their customers, what's needed by the marketplace that they're trying to serve, so whether that's an internal customer or an external customer. And it really got me thinking about uh, a bunch of experiences for myself over the years, uh, as well as, you know, especially as we do some of these retrospectives on different companies, you know, I think about things like, um, you know, VMware trying to move from, you know, being a software company into doing uh, vCloud hybrid or what was called, eventually became uh, called vCloud Air, you know, trying to get from software into into the cloud. Uh, I've seen a number of companies do that and, and struggle with that. You know, we've seen a number of companies who, uh, you know, do some things in which uh, they seem to have a really interesting product, but they can't seem to sell it. They can't seem to get market adoption. Um, you know, we talk all the time to companies who uh, internally are trying to roll out things and they can't quite figure out why this, you know, great technology that they put together doesn't work. And so what I thought I would do on today's Sunday Perspective is really kind of dive a little bit into, um, you know, why we oftentimes say that, oh, the people side of, of this is hard. The, the, you know, the technology is the easy part of this industry. People side of it is hard. And ultimately, uh, it really typically boils down to not so much, you know, do you have the right person in a role? Do, do people get along? Uh, but really organizationally, how are you structured? Are you structured in order to, to make the thing that you're trying to do uh, successful? Or does your organizational structure and the way that you measure things and monetize things and reward things, um, you know, is that almost you know, run contrary to what's, uh, what's the ultimate goal uh, that you're trying to build? So I thought I'd dive into that after the break. We all know that running global scale multi-cloud applications is difficult and expensive, but being locked into a single cloud provider sucks. That's why our friends at Section created the platform for easy and cost-effective multi-cloud operations. Section actually makes it easier to operate multi-cloud than on your current single cloud. Applications run in the best locations for end-user performance, reliability, and security, and you get to focus on building your apps, not your infrastructure. 
Visit section.io slash cloudcast to sign up for free with no credit card required. You can be running in under a minute. That's section.io slash cloudcast. Today's show is sponsored by CloudZero. For software-driven companies focused on growing margins, CloudZero is the only cloud cost intelligence platform that puts engineering in control by connecting technical decisions to business results. By analyzing cloud services like AWS and Snowflake, CloudZero provides real-time cost insights that help you maximize margins. Engineering teams can answer critical questions like, who are my most expensive customers? How much does this specific feature cost our business? What's the cost impact of re-architecting this application? With cost anomaly alerts via Slack, product-specific data views, and granular engineering context that makes it easy to investigate any cost, CloudZero is your complete cloud cost intelligence platform, connecting the dots between high-level trends and individual line items. Join companies like Drift, Rabbit7, and SeatGeek by visiting cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started today. That's cloudzero.com slash cloudcast. And we're back. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're going to dive a little bit into uh, not only the importance of kind of alignment with whatever you're planning to build technology-wise uh, with your organizational structure, the things that um, you know, are going to make up you know, how, it's, how it's measured, how, how value is created, how communication is done, how success is measured, all those sort of things. Um, you know, and, and look at, you know, not only what are some, what are some things to try and do, but also some things that sort of avoid and we'll try and use some, uh, examples in there of, of, you know, situations in which, you know, you can sort of point to well-known scenarios in which, uh, you know, maybe a great idea turned out to, to not have been terribly successful because you didn't get the organizational part right and you didn't get the, the people part of it right as opposed to the technology right. So I know we, we talk a lot on this show week in and week out about interesting technologies and we're, I think going to try and be more conscious this year of really kind of weaving in, um, you know, what is, what are the organizational things necessary in order to make that technology successful or what are the things that you need to avoid? So I'm going to try and make that a a part of regular questioning as we do the, you know, the interview shows on Wednesday, but I I thought I'd dive a little bit into it today. Um, just based on, again, um, you know, it got me thinking, like I mentioned, uh, Stephen O'Grady had written this article, uh, you know, highlighting, you know, it basically it, it, it spawned, he had talked to a developer or a development group, whatever it was, and was talking about what they were successful with, what they weren't successful with. And, uh, and the developer had said, well, you know, as, as many companies do, we ship our organization. And what he meant by that is, you know, the way that they deployed the technology, the way they had to architect the technology, um, was ultimately heavily influenced by their organization. And, you know, the things that maybe make the internal organization great, um, can oftentimes be, uh, problematic when it comes to other people, other groups, uh, using that technology. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the most obvious thing that, that we see with stuff like this is, you know, let's say you, uh, call into your telephone company or your, uh, TV provider, your cable provider, your streaming provider, and you're just like, hey, I just have a simple question. I just want to get something fixed. And you realize there are seven levels to the uh, to the automated dialer menu. Maybe there are three or four, uh, you know, levels to the chat bot that you have to get through. You know, essentially, you're like, hold on, why is why, why are you making it so difficult for me to do basic things, right? Maybe I, I just want to get uh, the status of what my my bill is. Maybe I just want to, you know, pay a bill. Oftentimes, it's like I want to give you money, and you're not accepting it for me. So we see those those types of things all the time. Um, and so I thought what I would do is, you know, kind of dig into, you know, how do we start thinking about getting the organization right? Um, and what are the things that we oftentimes get wrong? And what are some questions that you can ask in order to start figuring out, like, how, you know, if I'm walking into some sort of job or if I'm walking into some sort of situation, like, are we going to be well aligned or are we already broken uh, to a point where, you know, we can fix it or we can't fix it? So I think one of the things that the most maybe basic thing to sort of think about is as you have something that you are trying to ship out to the world, you want the world to use some piece of, of capabilities that you've built, whether it's a platform or it's a service or something else, you know, sort of ask the first question is what problem are we trying to solve, right? What are we trying to do with this technology? And, you know, what you're oftentimes thinking and where I see one of the first things that go wrong is um, companies will oftentimes or groups will oftentimes go, well, the problem we're trying to solve is, um, and, and the answer to that is oftentimes not put into the context of who their, their, their customer is or who their consumer is going to be, but it's something that, you know, helps better define them. So maybe it's, Hey, we, we are in this specific industry and our competitor does something else. 
And so we need to also do that thing, right? Um, you're not necessarily thinking about, you know, what is the the people who are going to pay you money for it or consume the technology, what are they looking for? But you think about it in terms of what does this do for me? What does this do for, uh, you know, our status, our capabilities, our competitiveness, whatever that be. So that, that's oftentimes the first thing that people get wrong is that they think about, they think about it from an internal perspective as opposed to an external perspective. The second thing that you often have to do is you really have to ask yourself, you know, does the, the customer, does the consumer of what you're doing, do they understand what you're providing? And more importantly, do they know how to associate the value that they, that they want, the things that they want, the things that they're willing to pay for with what you do? Because if it's very difficult to understand how, you know, you may actually get what their problem is right, right? Maybe you, you're you able to solve the problem that they're trying to do, but you do it in such a way that they're not able to go, oh, okay, I think that's valuable to me, right? And and sometimes this is just simply a pricing thing. You've priced it way too high for, for what they do. Uh, but again, this goes back to, do you understand what your consumer, what your customer, what your user is is looking for? And you do that in a way that not only you understand their point of view such that you're solving their specific problems that they don't want to deal with, but more importantly, do you understand how to represent or recognize the value that they rec- that they expect out of doing that? Do they save money? Do they save time? Do they save toil and hassle because they don't have expertise? Um, you know, do you give them a bunch of options and those options are valuable to them because maybe, maybe those options are things that they can then build upon in which they can monetize things or they can, uh, you know, create opportunity for themselves. And so, you know, you take a small piece of that. So I feel like that's the first thing that, that oftentimes gets, gets mixed up, uh, gets misunderstood as we talk about, you know, are, is your organization well aligned to the technology that you're building is really just a, Instead of having an inside out perspective is having an outside in perspective on, you know, why are we doing this? What is the value that's created? Um, is the value that's created understood by somebody else in such that they can consume it and, and get value from it? Or is it a long road in order to get that value? Um, you want to make sure you have that outside in perspective, understand value, understand, you know, not only the value that you think you provide, but the value that other people uh, perceive that they're going to receive from you and and understand is that a a one-time thing? Is that a multi-time thing? Is that a long-term type of thing? And really kind of understand uh, that. that. That's the most important thing. And again, you know, you could almost say that for for any business, right? There, there's no reason you go into business if you're not going to provide value to your customers and understand what customers' problem are as opposed to just delivering something that you think benefits, uh, you know, your, your company's portfolio. You need something. You need a, a red thing. You need a big thing. You need a whatever. The second thing that I think it really has to be understood is, you know, this thing that you're going to build, um, what does it look like from a, from a funding perspective? What does it look like from uh, an expansion perspective? So what this really means is, you know, who's going to, who's going to, you know, put the initial funding in for this, because anything that you build, um, you know, oftentimes you're going to have some mix of how much of the costs are up front, um, how much of the costs are going to be ongoing costs. So, uh, you know, in the case of, of something like software, uh, most of the cost of building the initial software is all up front. It's all people. And then once you've you've built that software and you're shipping it or you're, you know, you're running a service, you're, you're delivering a you know, cloud service, for example, um, you know, the ongoing costs are much, much smaller compared to that initial cost. Right. So you want to understand how are things going to be funded? Um, and then, you know, what happens as things need to expand, right? Like, will that expansion come from, uh, you know, the same source of funding? Will that expansion come from, um, only happen if, uh, the thing that you've built is profitable and is able to basically pay for itself as it goes along? Um, and then, you know, how will changes happen as you go along, right? So not only do you know where funding's coming from, you need to know where additional funding will come from. And so as things expand, where, where is that going to come from? And then also understanding, you know, how will things change? So, you know, as things evolve, as things change, what will be the model for that happening? Um, in some cases, maybe you've, maybe you've built a platform, um, that thing's going to evolve and, and people are going to build on top of it. You're going to get customer feedback. Sometimes that feedback is going to come from uh, internal groups saying, hey, we, we no longer are going to fund this or we're no longer going to provide support for certain things or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, the second thing you really kind of want to understand is, is sort of follow the money. What's the money going to look like up front? 
What's it going to look like as things expand? Um, how is the money going to be allocated? Is it based on, um, you know, there's a runway for getting certain things uh, to work or, or the startup model of like you get a bunch of money up front and you can, you know, burn through it accordingly. But, you know, the next round of being able to get funding will be based on success or it could be some other metric. Will it be, you know, this thing has to sort of be self-sustainable from, from day one beyond the initial funding. You want to understand all those sorts of things. And then the next thing you really kind of want to understand is how are we measuring things, right? How, how do things get measured? Um, and this is incredibly important. And I don't mean this in the sense of like, hey, we have a, you know, we attached a, a monitoring tool. We attached a data dog or a Prometheus or something to this and we can get a bunch of stats. What I mean by this is, do you really understand the full value chain in terms of, um, you know, again, going back to my customer, uh, but sort of the full value chain of, you know, is this something that if it's internally used, um, you know, how is it internally communicated? How are the, the internal users, uh, how are they using it? How do they see value in it? How do you measure that, right? And so, you know, you want to, but, you know, if you're dealing with um, something you're selling, it, you need to understand also what, you know, who, who, what's the selling process that goes on with this? So, um, you know, do you sell this directly to your customers? Do you have a sales force that's involved? Do you have a sales channel that's involved? So you sell through a secondary type of thing. So for example, if you're, you know, AT&T, uh, you may sell your phones directly. You may also sell them through Apple, but you may also sell them, uh, you know, or, or, you know, if you're Apple, you may sell them through AT&T. You may sell them through, you know, a, a big box store, like a, a Best Buy or, or, you know, Fry's or whatever it might be. Um, maybe you, you know, you OEM it through something else. You need to sort of understand all those things. And, and when I come back to how do you measure stuff, what I'm really getting at is, is yes, you want to understand how you measure things from an efficiency perspective. You know, are we, are we responding in a reasonable time? Do we have SLAs that we have to meet? Do we have monetary, you know, penalties if we don't meet those things? But you also really want to measure, um, especially as you start to get into who your customers are or what your channels are for distributing these things, communicating these things, what, how do you structure it such that they're successful, Right. And what I mean by this is, and I'll give you a you know, basic example, um, you know, if you have a sales force, oftentimes the sales force is going to be measured on, uh, you know, total dollars sold. That's typically the most you know common thing. But maybe you have parts of your value chain that are measured on things like how many meetings are created or maybe, maybe you're measured on, um, you know, some sort of efficiency thing, you know, like, hey, how many steps does it take to provision something? You know, you're trying to do self-service. How many steps are there to provision something? Um, and what you're looking for here is a couple of things. Number one, you're trying to measure yourself in terms of some sort of benchmark, right? Because the last thing in the world that you want to do is let's take a common example that a lot of us see. So maybe you've built an internal self-service platform for your developers. You know, you're you're trying to say, uh, we are a platform engineering team. We're here to enable developers to be successful. Forget about what kind of application they built, whether it's a microservice or a monolith or whatever. Maybe you're just there to go, hey, we're here to make sure that when you have an application that you feel is ready to ship um, and make available to to whoever your end customers are, we're going to help you deploy that. And we're going to help you deploy it in a you know safe, secure way. Well, what you're what you're trying to figure out then is um, you know, are you are you measuring for high availability? Are you measuring and uh, comparing yourself to, you know, an AWS or a DigitalOcean or somebody else where you say, oh, well, um, you know, I built this thing. It's the world's greatest thing, uh, but it takes 27 steps in order for somebody to to make something work. And you've exposed all 27 of those because not only do you want to showcase to people that, uh, you know, it's really secure and it does all these things, but what you may end up finding out is, well, there's an alternative to that using, you know, an external service, a uh, third party service that only exposes two steps. And maybe the same thing happens. Maybe it's secure and it gets deployed and it picks up, you know, an IP address and it picks up two Ethernet ports and it's sitting behind a firewall or whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, you, you want to be measuring not only, you know, what you've done, you know, again, SLAs and response times and, and availability, but you also want to be measuring what's your customer experience because your customer will ultimately be measuring what that looks like, right? If it takes, you know, it takes them 27 steps to do the same thing that somebody else can do in two steps, you're going to get a lot of pushback about, well, why we have to use you guys? Well, if, if you're that much more difficult, maybe I should start exploring more and more of it and you start figuring out, 
oh, wow, not only is it 27 steps, but it's also three times as expensive or it's whatever. All right, so you want to be measuring really everything in the value chain. You want to measure yourself. You want to measure the customer experience. And then the other thing you really want to kind of be thinking about in terms of measurement is, you know, for the people that are helping you uh, make your thing uh, known to the world, right, that are communicating it to the world, that are potentially selling it, that are potentially integrating with partners, what do they get measured on, right? Are they measured on dollars sold? Are they measured on number of prospects that they bring to the to the table? Are they measured on the number of partners that are engaged? Are they measured on something else? And the reason I mentioned that this is so important is um, because ultimately, and there's an old saying that, you know, the, the best way to to figure out somebody's um, sales compensation model, if you're talking about salespeople, is to go look at their comp plan. Because what will ultimately happen is, you know, if you are paying somebody or you're compensating or you're measuring somebody on some model, they will ultimately try and figure out the easiest way for them to achieve their numbers, especially if there's some sort of monetary compensation in there. And so, you know, if if you build a model that says, for example, hey, we're, we're offering this, um, you know, maybe you're offering a, a you know, a piece of technology, a service. And, you know, one of the things that your company ultimately would like to see is we'd like to see 500 partners uh, come onto the platform, right? We'd like to see 500 partners who are going to, you know, help your business in some way. You're going to provide a service to them. And what you might be thinking is like, oh, we're going to get 500 great partners. We're going to find the best 500 partners. But if you build your model such that, uh, you know, salespeople are compensated on just the volume as opposed to the quality of those partners, for example, you're going to get a volume of 500 partners. That won't won't be a problem because there'll be a a financial monetary incentive to get to 500 partners. But unless you put a quality metric in there, you may get 500 partners who either aren't aligned to what you're trying to do, who, you know, call the customer service uh, desk 24 by seven because they're not qualified. They don't have the technical needs. They don't have the domain knowledge that you need. All those sorts of things need to happen, you know, that that, that will happen um, if you allow the system to do that, right? So this is, again, where measuring things and putting things in place um, that align to what you're ultimately trying to do and then understanding, you know, what will happen on the flip side if you don't put certain things in place, right? Um, And the next thing, you know, as we think about this that is we really get into is, um, you know, especially if we're talking about software and, and technology and so forth is, are we, are we shipping, you know, a lot of times what we run into is we see really interesting demos and we see really interesting presentations on technology and so forth. Um, and, but what's not there is the, okay, we, we understand the technology. It uses this protocol. It use, does security some interesting way or whatever it might be. But we don't really ask, well, you know, what, how's this going to, to operate in real life? Because the demo is interesting. You click some things, the screen displays, whatever happens. Um, are we trying to deliver this? as a self-service capability, right? Is this something that, you know, is designed such that the expectation is um, people will be able to to come to this service in one way, shape, or form, whether they're reading the docs or looking at the UI? Um, is this going to be self-service? You know, is the expectation that there's not a lot of training involved uh, in order to do this? There's there's going to be, you know, a fixed number of things that are, that are going to be available to people. They're going to pick from a menu of options similar to if you go to fast food restaurants, you can pick a one, two, three, four, five, six, and maybe you can customize it a little bit. But, you know, they're trying to to really make it sort of self-service. They want to have, you know, predefined things you can do. Is that, that may be what you're trying to do, right? If that's, if that's the goal, build it that way. If you're delivering this as an API, um, you know, what you're making a different set of assumptions of is um, we have programmers. We're more focused on the API the security of the API, the backwards compatibility of the API, um, you know, they're going to be very dependent upon documentation. Do you, do you do that well? You know, so you have a different expectation of what the, the end consumer of this is going to be, right? It's not going to necessarily be self-service in the way of like easy to, easy to understand, you know, sort of click through drop down menu GUIs. It's going to be uh, API driven, and you're going to have a more of a programmer mindset. They're going to have certain things that they require. Or, um, you know, is this something that you're delivering that's an SLA service in which the thing that's 
probably most important is, uh, you know, the uptime, the availability, maybe the security of it. Um, you know, it won't necessarily be self-service. It may not even necessarily be driven by an API, but it'll be driven by, you know, some known predictable thing, right? You know, as much as, um, for example, when we, uh, let's say we want to, uh, you know, book a hotel reservation. Well, you know, the easiest thing to do would be to go to a website, click a button, have a drop down menu of what everything's available to you. And, uh, you know, you do it on your own. Maybe that's the thing you want to do. But maybe you you provide uh, a prestige service, right? Maybe you provide something that, um, you know, you don't necessarily want your competitors to easily be able to sort of look and see what's available. Um, you know, maybe you provide a higher quality type of thing. And so, uh, what you're focused on there is more of a, an SLA service, right? You want people to know that, hey, um, yes, you'd like to stay at this resort. Uh, you know, you'd like to see what's available. You click a button and it says, hey, we will get back to you within an hour. And if you're getting back to them within an hour and you've got a live concierge who then walks through what you're trying to do on your vacation or your resort retreat, whatever it might be, or how you can customize your trip, like that's a great experience because at that point you, you've you done what you've, you know, set out to do. Um, you haven't given away, uh, your availability or your experience to your competitors. At the same time, you've responded back to your customers in a well-known defined way. You do it every single time, and then you can bring that personal touch to it. And again, this really gets to what do your customers expect from you? Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's not a a cookie cutter thing. There's some customization involved. They enjoy talking to a live person. Um, and, and that may be a better fit, but in other cases, If you're just sort of booking, for example, commodity hotels or commodity rental cars or commodity flights, yeah, you don't want to be involved with somebody. You don't want to wait 45 minutes on the phone. You don't want to wait an hour. You want to be able to to check because maybe you're comparing two or three different things at the same time. So again, it really gets to, um, you know, kind of this hierarchy of, did you know what the customer wants? Um, Did you measure the things that are important to them? Did you think about, you know, how those measurements might be problematic or, or advantageous to what you're trying to do? And then understanding how do you deliver that in a way that is best aligned to, um, you know, what, what the customers want. Because the more the customers want, the more likely they are to come back to your service because there's value aligned to it. Now, the next sort of things that we run into that are oftentimes, um, you know, good or bad or problematic or things you have to think about is, you know, are you know, oftentimes especially as we, we think about these, what do we ship and, and what are we doing? You know, are we, are we building sort of centralized platforms? Uh, we've seen that quite a bit. And in some cases they work very well. In other cases, they, they don't work very well, but are we building centralized platforms or are we doing things on a group by group basis? Right? So a lot of what we've talked about in this show over the many years is how there's been this trend from going from centralized IT, centralized buying cycle, centralized budgets to more dist- distribution, uh, you know, sort of on a group by group basis. So this group doesn't necessarily like working with central IT. This group has certain unique needs. This group, um, you know, has is going to have buying patterns or usage patterns that are way different than everybody else. And you really got to think about, you know, how much does that centralization versus decentralization come into play? Because on one hand, the decentralization is going to give you a lot more flexibility. It's going to allow you to have much more input into the thing that you build or what's going on. But at the same time, you may not internally have any sort of structure. Uh, in fact, you may have anti-structure that you know allows you to sort of figure out, hey, what are the best practices from that other group? What could we have learned? Um, what could we have fast-tracked by working with somebody else? Um, do we have uh, within our team you know, expertise to do architecture? Do we have expertise to do all these things? Or are we just sort of, um, you know, sort of, you know, mediocre at doing this, but we're, you know, we do that because, you know, everything is, is group by group. And so there's going to be some, um, you know, some pros and cons to being centralized versus decentralized, uh, you know, how unique what you're doing is, but also, you know, what is the internal culture within your company? Is it competitive? Uh, you know, I've, I've heard of scenarios at banks in which, um, you know, and a couple couple banks are famous for this, where uh, they will they will go, hey, here's the project we're doing, and we're actually going to build, we're actually going to set uh, two teams off to go see who can build the best one, and the one that wins uh, keeps going, and the one that fails, oftentimes, uh, they're no longer with with the company anymore. Um, so, you know, that's a kind of an extreme example, but we've seen scenarios like that in which, you know, internal competition is set up. Um, again, that may or may not be a good thing uh, for what you're trying to do. Depends on again, what's your company's culture? What are you trying to do? Who are your end customers? How is this thing going to work long term? 
And then I guess the last thing to sort of keep in mind uh, as you're as you're working through different things is what are both your short term goals and your long term goals? And, you know, this is something that that startups face all the time is that, you know, long term, you'd like to build, you know, a, a, you know, a huge organization. You'd like to build these you know wonderful products, super feature rich, lots of things to do. But the reality is, you know, if you don't have users of the product, if you don't have customers, if you don't have people paying you or, you know, a, a number of other things uh, in the short term, that long term possibility may never happen. You may burn through all your money. You may, um, you know, make so many mistakes that uh, the, the leadership that's you know given you these opportunities uh, loses faith in you. Um, maybe you make certain mistakes early on that are so bad that technically, you know, you can't recover for six months or a year or whatever that might be. And so you're always having to sort of balance short-term goals and long-term goals. And you're really trying to also, as we, we think about this from an organizational perspective, um, you know, how well do those align with what the company's dealing with, right? So, you know, in a lot of cases, I'm, I'm sure, you know, and this is going to be relevant to a lot of different companies, you know, maybe last year or the last two years, you know, you've had a lot of flexibility because the economy has been good. Maybe uh, you've had a lot of funding available to you. Um, and come into this year and things are tighter. You know, the economy is different. Maybe funding uh, models are going to be different. And so maybe whereas you've had a, a longer term or midterm, uh, you know, kind of approach to what you're doing and how you're building things and how you're engaging with your customers, you may really suddenly be forced to make a lot of short term decisions. Maybe your budgets are cut back. Maybe you aren't going to be able to hire those two people that you really were expecting to to do to expand what you're doing. And you have to think about, OK, <clears throat> how you know, how do we then adjust to, to what's going on? And so you're constantly having to sort of make sure you have alignment or understanding of what are your group's short-term goals versus long-term goals. But also, do you have dependencies on other groups, you know, parent groups, you know, funding groups, uh, your internal customers, your external customers as to what, you know, their short-term and long-term goals are? And do you have alignment of those? Can you, can you stay aligned to those? Are you going to be, uh, you know, kind of go off, off the road because, um, you know, things changed. So all those things, I think I found over time, uh, you know, if I sort of, again, sort of recap and walk through these, um, you know, do you understand the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, the customers care about your customers care about, do you understand the value they perceive in that? And can you, can you, you know, demonstrate that value? Um, do you have a very good understanding of how things are funded, both, you know, near term, long term? how things are going to change, how things are, you know, if things expand, how that funding works. So make sure you, again, follow the money. Um, you know, you really want to understand how things are measured, both internally as well as externally, um, the dependencies that you have along the way, the things that um, could create behaviors that are good behaviors or, or you know, in other cases, bad behaviors. Um, do you know what type of service you're offering? Does the type of service you're offering best align to what your customers want? And is that potentially going to cause great conflict with, you know, how your organization runs, you know, maybe you want to offer a premium product, but your organization is notoriously cheap or they, you know, don't appreciate good customer service, right? So you want to, you know, make sure you, you understand that. And then you want to really kind of understand, is your organization one that uh, embraces centralization? Do they embrace uh, decentralization? Do they have uh, methods of internal communication such that, um, you know, either one of those groups can be successful or are you very siloed and, and communication doesn't happen all that frequently? And then do you have really good alignment between long-term and short-term goals? And I think if you think through, you know, those five or six things, and again, there's probably lots of other things and, and things can get specific what you do. Um, if you've thought through those, those five or six things, I think you'll, you'll often find that, um, you may not always get the organization that you want. You may not always be in the best situation to build the thing that you're trying to do with your organization, but at least it gives you sort of a framework of, you know, what does, you know, what is success going to look like? Um, what could failure look like? And then what are some of those areas if they're not all well aligned or they're not sort of best laid out for what you want to do? How can you, how can you adjust them? Either you adjust or they adjust depending again on, uh, how strong your culture is, how much you're able to adapt your culture, how much your group is able to have an influence on those things. So anyways, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, another Sunday Perspectives. Thank you as all for listening. Uh, we are off to a great start for 2023. In fact, uh, as I look at some of the numbers, it looks like we've we've gained quite a few new followers. So really excited for anybody who's uh, telling a friend about the show. Um, we've gotten a number of really nice uh, five-star ratings here recently, uh, you know, in, in however people are are uh, listening to their podcast. If you get a chance to do that, it really helps us. Um, you know, again, 
your feedback, uh, even if it's into the systems, even if it's not necessarily directly to us, um, does have an influence on uh, on other people finding the show and, and you know, again, um, you know, telling a friend and helping us grow the show. So um, excited for a lot of stuff coming up this year. We've got uh, already, uh, you know, shows booked out through February and March. Really excited about what's coming next. So thanks as always for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for listening to the show. And we'll be back next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media.